Okay. Um, hi. I'm Leonard Patering. Um, I'm going to talk today about systemd. Um, I did a talk about systemd pretty much exactly two years ago at Fast Fostem. And uh, yeah, so that's why I called the talk uh, the first two years. Um, OK. Um, I'll, I'll start the talk with a little bit of uh,
around 50 or something. So um, the focus of systemd has always been uh, that we kind of cover the full range of Linux itself. So um, we care about mobile, about embedded, and about desktop and server the same way. It basically means that the basis for your phone OS could be the same as for your supercomputer. And that's actually, I mean, that's kind of impressive because, because um, a lot of the, the, the other software, like, for example, Solaris SMF is probably nothing you ever want to use on mobile. Um, but we want to really try to cover all these different um, bases. And that's, that's actually really interesting in many, many ways because quite often it turns out that, that problems that are specific to one of these areas, like specific to the server, end up being hugely useful on the other end of the spectrum as well. For example, the embedded people, they, they supplied us patches for, for doing um, hardware watchdog stuff. Hardware watchdog stuff is relatively simple. It basically just says you have this device and you ping it, and if you stop doing that, the machine will automatically reboot. It's a technique to increase reliability of, of, of embedded hardware. Now, as it turns out, something like this is not only hugely soft, uh, useful for embedded hardware, but on the other end of the spectrum on the server, that's also what you require for high availability setup. So um, yeah, we added this feature there, ended up being really, really useful on the other end as well. And there's a lot of other stuff like that. What? Um, uh, like, for example, what are you doing? Um, anyway, so and, and this happens like, for example, resource management. Um, resource management basically is uh, what you have to do if you run a lot of servers and have limited resources available, a lot of services and have limited resources available, you need to make sure that the available resources are nicely distributed according to your rules um, on the servers that are running. Now, resource management has been for quite some time um, been important for servers, right? You want to make sure that Apache and MySQL both get an equal amount of CPU and memory um, and not one um, gets way more than the other and then things starve and you get all kinds of problems. Or even more, like you have a couple of customer sites running on a single server and you want to make sure that not one customer can monopolize the CPU and the others can't. So you want to make, make sure that the resources that you have available on, this, uh, on the server are actually distributed in some kind of way among your services um, properly. Now this resource management also ends up being useful very much on the embedded hardware. Because on embedded hardware, you usually, usually have very little resources, so it becomes even more important that what you run on the embedded hardware gets, gets an equal amount or like the appropriate amount of uh, um, resources assigned. So, and yeah, and there, there are lots of examples like that. Sometimes there's desktop stuff that ends up being usually uh, useful for, for the server as well. Or, or embedded stuff that ends up being useful for the desktop stuff. So, yeah, the same way as the Linux kernel manages to cover all the bases from embedded mobile desktop server, we want to cover the same thing for systemd as well, because we figured out that most of the problems actually reappear on the other end of the spectrum as well. Um, yeah, we nowadays have consistently boot times um, of less than one second for user space. We'll actually do a demo here on Kai's laptop, which is, is lying right here. We're not going to do this on this laptop because um, actually the the initialization times for projectors, like during boot, a little bit too slow, so we, you couldn't actually see that. Um, we have these boot times of less than one second for user space. Um, of course, unfortunately, Fedora, um, like as the distribution that I use and that I work for, doesn't really provide that out of the box. Um, a couple of reasons for that. One of the bigger ones is LVM and these kind of things. Um, we want to go for supporting that out of the box on Fedora eventually, too. Um, but right now, Fedora will boot slower. But anyway, um, Kai, can you show that? Um, so Kai has a laptop here which runs pretty much unmodified Fedora. Um, the only change is basically that we don't have LVM and um, very few other things um, not enabled. So this is already rebooted, actually. It's, it's, a, it's the information from the, from the last boot. Now, what you see here now, is, is that the, we, we will actually break down with the system the analyze command. We will actually um, tell you how the performance of the last boot was. Now we can see that the firmware, like the bias, and uh, the, the, really the post, um, the initial initialization of the hardware, took uh, seven seconds. The bootloader took 35 milliseconds only. The kernel t took. Uh, it is not rust. Hmm? It is not rust. 
as, yeah, as you might see, this like 35, uh, 34 milliseconds, that's definitely not grub, because grub, like already initializing grub takes a second or something like that. Uh, this is gummy boot, actually. Um, the kernel takes uh, 1.2 seconds, and then user space uh, um, currently in this boot here required uh, slightly more than one second. Um, There's a sleep one in there. <laughs> <laughs> in total, it's uh, 9.6 seconds. That's, of course, not good enough yet. On modern hardware, where, exa for example, the firmware, um, like, like the Windows 8 certified machines, like Windows, uh, the, like the, if you want to have a certified machine, you need to make sure that your hardware, um, to get the certificate, your hardware needs to, to boot in less than two seconds through post. So with that in place, we can boot an entire Linux machine in like five seconds or so. So if you, if, you, if you look at this distribution, you will actually see it's, it's quite complete, right? We have all these desktop-y things like uPower. We have UDFD anyway. We have accounts demon policy kit. Color daemon, even like the, the, pro the profiling stuff, Avahi, like this is like NTPD, it's all like in GDM, it's like a really complete distribution. The only thing that is basically changing from, from Fedora default is that we did not install an LVM because LVM is like, it's the major source of slowness. Um, I mean, we have some LVM developers still away, sorry. Um, I will just say it, I mean, has been two years ago and still is. Well, let's discuss that otherwise. But anyway, um, so we, can, we did show you just these numbers, like uh, how fast it is. But let's actually see how fast it is uh, by demoing it. Now, this is a rawhide machine. So we hope it's actually working. But um, so yeah, now we're in uh, post. These are the seven, seven seconds, basically. And the, turn, the screen turns black when the bootloader comes. And oh, that's go mode ready. So yeah, that's a little hard to see, but you see actually, yeah, it, it, it just got up. It's like, uh, it, that was that one second for user space, one second for kernel. It's so dark. It's, it's actually gray, um, the machine that projects that. But you see the, you recognize that this is GNOME, right? But it changed. <laughs> what did it change? What's a bit, yeah. Something changed in the, the projector. I think that maybe that's because of the, can you shift it? Yeah, actually, in real life, the thing is green, what we see here. Like, if we see that's gray, it's, it's, the projector is a little bit confused. Um, but anyway, you, what you saw, basically, is you, you saw those seven seconds for the post, and then you saw the two seconds after the post when it was black, and then it was already GNOME up there. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, real, the, the reason why we use this, this weird projector is basically that that, uh, yeah, well, projectors usually take time when, when video modes are switched, and that sometimes or usually takes more than one second, so it kind of destroys the, the demo. But this thing destroyed the demo anyway, because you can't actually recognize that it's GNOME. But anyway, yeah, you see the GNOME 3 stuff here. Anyway, let's turn back to the slides. By the way, again, if you guys have questions at any time, just interrupt me. Um, I'm really interested in... Uh, Questions. So yeah, um, we have consistently boot times of less than one second. This one wasn't, but uh, we generally have. Um, the the kernel debugs? No. This is this is pretty much unmodified Fedora 19, but uh, without LVM, basically. So it doesn't use anything um, your Divas, anything that wasn't in, in, in any standard distribution. I, I think it uses a, it basically uses Fedora 19 and maybe a snapshot of current system D, but that's it. Um, okay. Um, as we develop system D, we have obsoleted a couple of things. I mean, obsolete here is this very wide term, uh, supposedly here. So we, we replaced console kit, which um, used to be the stem that managed uh, logins and sessions and uh, um, seeds um, by something called LoginD, which is a component of, of systemd. Um, it provides uh, quite some more than console kit um, used to do, like, for example, proper multi-seed support. 
So you can actually, like if you have, have multi-seat hardware, like these little USB boxes that provide you an additional screen, an additional keyboard, additional sound, and these kind of things, you can now plug that into your, your system new machine. So this we will, will recognize that it's one of these devices and we'll just say, here's a new seat. GDM will then take, pick that up and bring a login screen. So, and that's fully automatic without reconfiguring anything. So, um, yeah, we, we did this console kit. It's, it's much nicer than console kit used to be because we, we can rely on integration of the kernel in a way that was not available before. For example, we can easily track membership of a process of a session by doing cgroups magic. Um, I'm pretty sure like two years ago when you were at that talk, you probably heard the term cgroups. I'm not going to go into detail what that is. But um, suffice to say, the console kit replacement that we did with LogND is, is hugely more powerful than uh, console kit used to be. We replaced system five init, it's kind of obvious, um, and the init scripts package. The init scripts package, I mean, in this case, it kind of means like all kinds of different implementations of that, like the Debian has its own init scripts package and Fedora used to have its own as well. Um, we kind of replaced that because all the early boot stuff, we nowadays have um, paralyzed um, little implementation we see which are nicely configurable and are kind of common in, in similar configuration files. We um, obsoleted PM utils. PM utils had the job of uh, suspending and hibernating this, the machine. It used to have a huge amount of quirks, like uh, because uh, um, like user space quirks dealing for specific hardware that exposed certain bugs. But um, as it turns out today, that's mostly not necessary anymore. They're only very exotic hardware that still needs that because the kernel got fixed. Like the kernel drivers are nowadays able to apply these quirks in a much saner way. Anyway, we don't need any user space components. So um, because system D already managed powering off the machine, powering it on, we added and rebooting and these kind of things, we just added um, support for suspending and hibernation as well because it's kind of the natural thing. It's, it's, it's so that system D can, can manage the entire life cycle of the machine and that definitely includes suspending and hibernation. Um, of course, we did it really nicely, like better than PM utils did it because we now have uh, have um, inhibitors and these kind of things so, so that arbitrary user software can actually hook into the suspend process and do something right before the machine goes down, which is very useful, for example. Let's say you have, have your text editor and you want to make sure that, that that text editor actually saves everything to disk before going into suspend so that if the battery runs out, you don't lose anything. And then there are other, many other uses for, for that as well. So, yeah, we replaced INAD. That's probably one of the more obvious things as well, at least if you know that system D does socket activation. I know for sure that last time, two years ago, I did talk about socket activation in more detail. Again, I'm not going to talk about that very much because it's very technical. But um, suffice to say, we do basically everything that classic INAD did in system D as well. And of course, um, we try to make it more useful. So we will not just cover um, internet sockets, but all kinds of other um, sockets as well, and even some things that are technically not really sockets, like for example, FIFOs or POSIX message queues and these kind of things. Um, we replaced ACPID. Um, ACPID is a little daemon whose only purpose it was to, um, to uh, when somebody presses the power key, shut down the machine. That's basically what it did. It was a bigger project, did a lot of other things too, but nobody ever used that. People just used it to like hook up the stupid power button with power off. And we thought maybe that's some functionality that should not be, require any additional software that should really just work. It's about powering off the machine. Especially since the reboot button and since control L Dell um, um, is, is implemented either in hardware or by system D anyway. So we thought, well, maybe the power button should be handled the same way. So, um, and, and, and everybody needs that, right? Like, like admitted hardware servers Desktops, they all have power buttons that should work as um, they're supposed to. So, uh, yeah, we dec decided, well, listening to one key is not particularly hard. Everybody wants it. Maybe you should just move it down into system and just do it, and it will just work. Um, something else we kind of um, replaced to Syslog. That's um, with something called the journal. Um, I figured it has been discussed while in the community already. Um, Basically, we looked at syslog and uh, figured out, um, well, I mean, we have been, been, been looking at syslog for quite some time. And, and what we always wanted is that we can actually query the syslog logs for all messages from a specific service. 
However, syslog only stores linear text files from top to bottom without any kind of indexable information, right? It does not actually know anything from which service things came. Um, basically, I mean, it's untrusted data. Every application can send, send data into it and pretend it was Apache, and syslog will just store it and not care. Um, so we, ha we had a lot of issues with that, like we, because we want to have a secure system where, where the services cannot lie about who they are, and where we actually have this information which service it did and can index it so that the, that the query of the, of the log database stuff is fast. So um, we are perfectly compatible with, with, I mean, for all of this that I listed here, basically, you still can install ACP ID. You can still install syslog, and, and in fact, Fedora does that by default. You can install INAD, you can install still PMUtils. We're totally compatible with that. We will not break these things. Um, so uh, the only thing that we basically can't install anymore is System 5 init because only one process can PID, be PID1. But um, yeah, it's just that you don't really need that anymore because we have it simpler and usually more powerful in the, in the basic stuff anyway. Something else we kind of um, replaced is the watchdog support. I already talked about that earlier. Um, it's something that is usually useful in embedded and, and on uh, servers. It's not so useful on the desktop, but it's an absolutely trivial thing to do and actually should really be done in systemd because only then you have this nice chain that the hardware watches what systemd does and then systemd watches what the services do. Um, yeah, it's actually very simple to use and very powerful. Then CG rules D, I'm not sure if you guys know that. It's something C group specific. It basically is a daemon that tried to move during runtime services into specific C groups to apply resource limits to them. It was, I mean, it, it was a very weird thing because it actually did that asyn asynchronously. So instead of like right when the service was started up, making sure that before the service was forked off, it was already clear it would end in that C group. It would just watch what was happening in the system, apply some rules, and magically move it into that, which, of course, yeah, it's, it's ugly. <laughs> then um, we kind of moved quite a few functionality that was traditionally done by cron into systemd. Um, not everything, um, and we, again, we are totally compatible with the classic stuff, but um, there are many, many reasons why it is actually useful to uh, have uh, um, something like cron, like calendar-based um, timing and systemd as well. Um, yeah, um, it, 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 the stuff that we have in, in systemd is in, in some ways more powerful than cron is, but in other ways um, less powerful. For example, we don't do user um, cron jobs, anything similar to that. But we have basically have a calendar language now that is more expressive than what, uh, what uh, cron can actually express in its tables. Like, like it has a second granularity and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and at the same time, um, we kind of considered at like the same problem. Um, as mentioned, this has obsoletes, but you can still install this all parallel, and then probably most distributions will. I don't expect for Fedora, for example, to anytime soon not install cron by default. I mean, I personally believe cron is a really useful tool. Like, um, even though systemd can schedule things by time, um, you would have to create a service file and a, a timer file for it. And admittedly, using cron and just running one line can often be easier. So uh, this is not an attempt to kind of remove this from the distributions or making this unavailable to administrator. It's just, um, yeah, we have this in systemd, and there's a lot of functionality in there that you don't have with the classic tools. So you can use it, but you don't have to. Um, OK, so much about the status quo, and uh, a little bit like giving a position, like as an explanation where we currently are with system D. Are there any questions to this point? There's a question, like, uh, can you? Just a, Jesus Christ, <laughs> sorry. Um, just a short question. Can you uh, essentially, if you install a Fedora uh, 19 system, can you actually deinstall all these things and just run with system D if you would, you know, just to see if it will work or? I didn't entirely, can what, you, what can you install? Just all the stuff that you obsolete, can you just deinstall everything and just like... Actually, you mostly can. You can uninstall um, INAD and ACPID anyway, you can uninstall syslog, watchdog, CD rules D. You can mostly install cron, but then of like many packages drop in cron jobs. We are working on that, that to make that at least possible, and there's currently talk on the Fedora mailing list to port over at least some uh, stuff to cron. We'll have to see about that in detail. Um, you can remove ATD. You 
can't really remove init scripts because things depend on it. But uh, most of the stuff you don't really need anymore. Sys5 in it, it doesn't really exist anymore. And console kit um, is not shipped by default anyway anymore. What, what's still in init scripts? Thanks. So, I mean, the thing that Inniscript still does that is useful is, is static networks, like all the stuff that's not network manager, basically. Um, but yeah, you basically can remove one of those. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, so um, uh, systemd interprets the FS tab right now and creates like virtual units. Uh, will the same thing happen with the Chrome tab? Yeah, that's actually something. Uh, so everybody got the question. The question is like currently FS tab does, is parsed by systemd for compatibility purposes and because we actually think that FS tab is a cool thing because it's very simple and things like that, if we could do the same thing for, for the cron tabs. So I think uh, the cron tabs are not a very nice language. I think it's very simplistic. Um, so my guess is that we probably will cover cron.daily and cron.weekly and, and these kind of drop-in directories because they are really super nice to use and we can, can nicely integrate them into, in the system tree as well. But I don't think we'll do the same for cron.d. I think, like, for, for the actual cron tab stuff, we kind of assume that, like, like, at least for the Fedora ca case, the way it currently looks like, we might convert everything that actually installs more than just cron daily and cron weekly and cron hourly. Scripts will probably use timer units, but we have to see about that. But, uh, of course, um, even if a distribution doesn't want to go systemd all the way, the way Fedora decided to do it, um, they can on their own write a generator for that that generates the stuff. That's totally doable. Um, it's just that it's probably not something we want to do upstream. But yeah, there's another question. This way. Uh, just a little question. Um, Systemd is in, uh, today integrated with a lot of systems like uh, Red Hat, soon Red Hat, uh, Fedora, Arch Arc Linux. But you are superseding projects like uh, syslog, uh, ng, rsyslog. So how do you deal with communities? Are you offering them to work with you? Or? So um, uh, we actually, like, like, like before we did the journal, we actually, um, I, I talk frequently to the rsyslog guy. Um, he doesn't look like me very much anymore. I don't know why. But, um, <laughs> It's uh, like uh, we actually like like we suggested be we wanted that stuff right we wanted we wanted the indexing and, and we were not necessarily looking into doing that our own, on our own. Our syslog, I mean, there are actually patches from me in in our syslog, for example, for the socket activation stuff that we do in in, in systemd, and um, so yes, we did work with them, but eventually we came to the conclusion that they probably never would wanted to give us what we wanted, which is basically index stuff. They had different focuses than we had on our stuff. And then we eventually decided to just do it on our own. Um, one of the Syslog NG guys, um, um, he's very, like, he's going to be at the Hackfest, as I saw um, on Google events, actually. So yeah, there's, there's cooperation there. There used to be with our Syslog guy. Um, but um, yeah, is that an answer? <laughs> I mean, of course, if you install Syslog NG or, 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 or our Syslog, it's, it's just will work, right? Um, we, we quite carefully make sh made sure to not break anything. In fact, um, like even if the journal um, records everything as well and, and, and everything is routed to the journal, this ultimately is a good thing for our syslog and syslog ng as well, simply because we collect much more data via the journal. Because the journal can run during early boot and the journal actually gets connected to every single service of the system so that we get STD out and STDR. And we will then forward all of that from, in a, from, from early boot and, 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 and things like that, all to that, it, we, it will be forwarded to syslog and, and r syslog. So, uh, syslog and g and r syslog. So, um, yeah, they, they ultimately benefit from this in a, in a way too, even though it's not ne really necessary anymore to install it by default. But, I mean, there's no, to, 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 there's no doubt in the world that syslog and g and r syslog have, have really useful use cases for the future as well, simply because the journal does not implement the the um, syslog protocol, and we don't intend to. Um, like, um, it's, a, it's, a com it's a protocol that has grown over years and, and for most of its history didn't really have a specification. So it's, it's really, like it's a complex protocol because you always have to deal with the different ways the hardware and, and, and software implemented it. So we don't have an interest in that. It's like, it's, it's, we totally see the use case for that. Like if you, if you have a server, Set up and you want to connect, um, like collect all the log data from various hardware. Um, 
It's a different use case, basically, than the journal. But again, they benefit from the journal as well, as the journal is this concentrated thing that pulls way more data than Syslog traditionally got, and we pass it on. And we pass it on with all the metadata, like if they want. Uh, so I have a simple question. How long until systemd merges the Linux kernel? Thanks. And also, the name of your blog, uh, Allbreaker Audio, is it intentional, is it trolling, or what? Thanks. I didn't really get the question, sorry. <laughs> I meant, uh, how long until systemd merges in the Linux kernel? You merged already a lot of stuff like UDEF and so on. Thanks. I uh, will. Uh, we will probably move a couple of more things into systemd, to be frank. Um, the thing is, like, we, we, it is, of course, a question, where, where do we put the limit? Um, like, um, of course, there's stuff where we absolutely clearly know that we'll never move that into systemd. But basically, um, our definition of what should be in systemd is everything that you need to build the basic building block. And we will, but, but it doesn't really mean that, that anything was monolithic and you couldn't separate things and things went, went modular anymore. It just means that we develop them in the same Git repository and share more code in them. It's, it's not unlike how, for example, the BSD model is. In BSD, much of the core OS user space is kept in a single um, CVS or SVN repository and is actually developed in sync with their kernel. And uh, we're not going that far. We never will merge the kernel into into our tree or the other way around because that doesn't make any sense and, and there are other user spaces for, for Linux anyway. Um, but what we want to do is, is we want to like, look at what the other Unixes are doing and take a little bit back and kind of like, because I think it's a good model. Like on Linux traditionally, all these little components that, that consist of the boot, like for example, everything like this, we, there, there, was a, there was a separate project, a separate Git repository for, for the bloody power key handling. It's like that, that's not, a, not, a, not something that, that's, that uh, really scales because every single of these components, how trivial they might be, like for example, ACP ID and the most extreme thing, they impl re-implemented all the service management. They, they, they shared a lot of boilerplate code and was basically, yeah, all of them recompiled, that, uh, rebuilt that, wrote it in their own code and most of them didn't really do that actually that well. So with systemd, we want to unify this much of this really more trivial code, especially, because everybody needs it. Because if you share code, you can actually reduce footprint because you have less code to execute. And uh, we improve the testability of things because if you share code, you can much l uh, more likely actually test the stuff that you run. I mean, yeah, and then like also this stuff, like if you have all these various components that you put together in, in, in different combinations, like many of the distributions really like doing that kind of stuff, that you can use any version of the kernel with any version of UDEF, with any version of libc, with any version of, and, and all these kind of things. It's, it explodes the test matrix. And that's actually a huge issue, because um, if we ever want to ship these kind of things to people, we need to make sure, we need to have a rough idea that it will actually work for people. And you don't do that like, yeah, anyway. So our approach there is, well, some of the basic building blocks should just be developed in sync, updated in sync, and tested in sync so that we actually have a good, good idea. It's a question, basically, of, of um, how to, to do your design process, how you do your development process, your testing process. And we believe it's, we should copy that thing from, from the traditional Unixes where they did that more in a repository. I hope that's kind of an answer. There's more. Are, are C groups going to make it so that on my desktop system, if I have like a simple fork bomb, it's not going to make my desktop shell unresponsive anymore? And how's that going to work? So there, there is a controller that is supposed to, to uh, um, deal with fork bombs. I, I didn't entirely get the question, but it's, it was something about fork, fork bombs on the desktop, right? There's a controller that does fork bomb protection um, developed by some people at Red Hat. I'm, I don't know what the current state of that is and it's going to get in. Um, I don't know. Yeah, we probably support us that something like that one day. If that's um, like, I don't know. It's a very specific question. Ask me afterwards. I think. Um, are there any further questions? That there are. Yeah, there's one other. Hi. It's about uh, compatibility with previous behavior. In particular, things like FS tab. Um, older systems, when an FS tab failed to mount would continue to boot, and I believe that's not always the case by default, possibly. Um, are you going to try and continue to maintain that behavior, or um, what's your behavior on failure kind of philosophy? 
Um, I didn't really get the full question, but it was something about compatibility with FS tab and things. Well, it's more about um, older systems. If FS tab tried to mount a device that was no longer present or had failed, um, it would continue to boot. Now we don't do that, and it's basically a philosophy of behavior on failure. Okay, so basically, um, you current, you're already in, in a classic um, um, system, five minute systems, you, there's al al already the flag called no auto and no fail. And it had slightly less of a meaning that it has for systemd because, uh, um, yeah, system five did, did cared less about that. But basically, when you traditionally already had to use no auto and no fail in FS tab, you still have to do that. It's basically the same definition, except that, yeah. But what, what currently happens, basically, if you do not mark a file system as no fail, then systemd assumes that it is important that it doesn't fail at boot. It might be security sensitive if it's, if it's not mounted. And then we'll actually, like, it will, it will wait for it to show up. If it never shows up, then it will, the system will put you in an emergency mode, and you have to authenticate, and will give you a little bit of log output why you actually ended in the emergency mode. So that's the approach there. But by default, unless a, 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 an entry in FS top is marked as no fail, we assume that everything you list there must be around during boot, and if it isn't, um, we'll enter emergency mode. It's a little bit different from traditional stuff. It's, it's a little bit harder, but I think it's, it's technically more correct to do it this way. Hi. Um, I, kn I know that systemd use cgroups for tracking processes, but uh, is there any plan to use uh, LXC to confine services um, in the near future? So that's an interesting question. Actually, it's one of the things I have here on the, it actually was my next slide, um, about container support. Um, so let, let me talk a little bit about the future at this point of, of systemd. Like I have three slides here about the future. I don't really like to talk too much about the future because then we'd probably have to fight the days, the, 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 the fights of tomorrow already today and I'm not looking forward to that. But uh, um, anyway, so, so for, the, for the near future, future we want to add more nicer container support. We already have relatively nice container support, but there's a couple of things we would like to add. Containers, for those who don't know, are basically a form of virtualization where the same kernel uh, runs a couple of uh, operating systems basically side by side. Um, in systemd, that is very nicely supported. We actually ship a tiny binary called systemd nspawn that just uses the, the kernel interfaces for setting up containers and can boot an operating system in it. For example, um, like, it is very useful. You can, can use it on Fedora to, to boot up a Debian system, um, and it will just work. Um, it's, it, it feels a little bit like, like the change root command you used, uh, you, you know, like the binary. Um, you, you use, for example, to, to uh, I don't know, if your machine, machine is broken, you mount all the file system, then you use change root to move into it to fix something. Um, systemd nspawn is, does basically the same, but in contrast to just setting up a change root environment, it will, it will set up an entire container for you. Um, and uh, then you get a shell and will do much more than change what does like mounting things and, and all these kind of things. It's a really useful tool. The container support in the system is of course not limited to this nspawn tool which is really tiny. Um, it can also support LXC and libvirt LXC which by the way are completely different projects. Even uh, the name might suggest they're actually the same but they're not. Um, or any kind of other virtualization. Um, the, we have, the system D actually comes with, a, with, a, with an interface to the container manager. Um, so it, it's very, very simple stuff. Like, for example, the container manager can tell system D the UUID that, the, that should be used to identify the system, and then, then uh, um, system D will use that to, to, um, um, to initialize the UID of the, like the, the system itself. It's, it's, it's really nice. Um, in the long run, we want to bring system D more to the level of what Solaris can do with zones. Like on, on, on Solaris zones, what you can do is, is um, you cannot only get an idea about the services running on the host, but with the same command, you can actually enumerate all the services running on all your containers, on all your zones, on the system as well. And this is all very useful functionality and individually really not that hard to implement, and we should provide the same on Linux too. So basically, that system control, if you type that, it will yeah, show you the, everything from your host and the containers inside. Um, the container support in systemd is actually really nice and can do tricks that nobody else could do before. Um, one specific thing here is, is auto-spawning. 
we can, can auto spawn entire containers on demand. For example, um, you have one container where you put your Apache and MySQL in, and uh, with the container support in systemd, you can use socket activation for that, so that the host initially listens on your, your HTTP port, and the moment the first connection comes in, it will actually spawn the entire container, the entire um, OS inside of it, both Apache and MySQL inside of it, hand over that socket, and then the container can, uh, will pass it on to, like the, the systemd inside the container will pass it on to MySQL and then HTTPD. So um, that, is, that is a huge, a hugely useful um, technology, actually, because it allows you to increase the density of, of customer systems on your server. Because it basically allows you um, to, to run a ton load of containers on one system and actually only, only have them use up resources when they're actually used. This is especially useful for, for, for like, I mean, there are a uh, um, couple of companies, like, or web hosters, which have these kind of one-click things where you can, with one click, set up a, a, a tested machine and then test your stuff. With this thing, it basically comes free because you don't actually have to run something for that. All you have to do is create that, like, actually make the listen, and then if actually somebody uses it, you, you invoke the container. This is, this is actually really, really nice stuff. Um, this all also goes on the other side, um, out of shutdown, which basically means that, yeah, um, we have to figure out when the container is idle to shut it down again so that you make the best of your resource usage. Now, the auto shutdown stuff is actually really interesting because um, what I talked about earlier about this thing that we want to cover the whole range of, of, of Linux users from embedded to desktop to server, the auto shutdown stuff, like figuring out when a container is idle and shutting it down then, is actually the very same problem that you have on laptops where you want to suspend the laptop as soon as the machine gets idle. And uh, so that's one of these nice things, because we already have the auto suspend stuff. We can extend it just a little bit and make it work for containers as well. So yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question regarding containers. So it's going to be awesome, and it is already awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, just a second. There is a previous question here. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to uh, ask you to elaborate on something you said earlier. You said. Uh, that when you have a web server and a database server, uh, systemd can make sure they fairly share resources. Does that just come down to managing nice levels and POSIX limits, or is it more advanced than that? Or? So um, nice levels and, and resource limits are inherently process bound, which makes them pretty much useless on anything you want to do these days. Because Apache is not one single process. Apache is usually, um, it, it spawns worker pr processes, quite a few of them, and then these worker processes um, um, spawn CGI processes and PHP whatever processes. So um, Apache actually is usually not one process, but more like a like hundred or so, depending how big your system is. So actually setting the, the classic POSIX resource limits on them is pretty useless. Now what you can do with systemd is that it will enable you to use cgroup for that. Cgroup is a kernel feature that allows you to group processes into, into, into one cgroup and then apply resource limits to it. So um, this stuff is kernel supported basically and systemd gives you a very nice interface to make use of this. So you can basically say, yeah, whatever happens, Apache, with all its worker processes and everything, gets only this much memory. And it will get this CPU priority in total. So even that if my, uh, when MySQL has only three processes running and Apache has 100 processes running, because each of one form one group, they will still, Apache gets half and MySQL will get half and uh, it's going to be evened out, right? So. Um, it's, 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 it actually makes resource management workable for the first time in Linux before everything else. Like be, before that, you could, the only thing you could do basically is, is run all your services as a single process, which is completely illusionary. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, that's pretty cool. It is. <laughs> um, Any chance we'll see uh, user space checkpoints and uh, restore for these containers? Checkpoint restore? Good question. Um, let's just say, I'm not convinced that checkpoint restore is such a fantastic idea, I don't know. I'm not sure it really can work, like, re you know, so the question was regarding checkpoint restore, it's basically a facility that you can, if you have a process, you can save the current state of the process to disk, and then later on, possibly even on, on another machine, you read that image again and, and the process continues running where it is. There's a huge amount of problems with that, I think, because processes 
use a lot of resources of the operating system and getting those resources like file descriptors, sockets, internet connections, whatnot, getting those back into the same state as before, to me, appears not workable. I know that people disagree on that. Um, um, maybe I can be convinced. I don't think so, but uh, it's, I'm not convinced of, about the idea. So, yeah. Any further questions? There's questions. Where was it? No, there was another guy. Ah, okay. Uh, what is your view on uh, taking this system D for, uh, you know, the tiny embedded applications where the flash size is like 4 MB, 8 MB, or 16 MB maximum? So, is it a good idea to take up this uh, system D for a build root or busy box based, you know, tiny application, embedded applications. So does it really fit the, the system D approach? Because this seems to be very interesting because we are talking about boot times in only few seconds. So which also involves a lot of uh, hardware initialization and uh, stuff like where we are dealing with so many, uh, you know, sleeps in the startup to, you know, have a um, the problem is uh, really in embedded where uh, we really want to have a gracious startup and shutdown of services and uh, so th this looks very interesting actually. So what is your view on such uh, tiny embedded applications? I'm not entirely sure I understand everything of that but the question was basically about um, using systemd like on the, on the lower end of embedded, right? Um, so, of course, if you have a if you have an embedded system that just wants to run run process and nothing else, there's no point to involve systemd in that. Um, that said, I think it reaches quite low. It's like I know that a lot of people use systemd in conjunction to BusyBox. Um, for example, I don't know. Systemd is nowadays used in, in wind machines and in, in cars. It's built into cars, like the Genevieve um, people, for example. All the coming cars from any companies involved in January, like BMW and things like that, will run systemd, um, which is kind of, oh my god, but um, yeah, you, you find it in, 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 in toys, you find it in everything already. Um, I'm not sure how far you can scale it down, but you should know that, that most of the stuff we include in it are, are compile time op optional. So you can just use with configure. It's basically like the Linux kernel itself, where you can choose while you build it what exactly you want to build. You have the same stuff in, in systemd as well, where you can pass a lot of flags to configure. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think my time's over though. Yeah, um, unfortunately the time is running out, so if you have any other question, just ask the speaker. We will probably hang around the conference. Yep. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much for the good questions. <laughs>